Hello, I'm Richard Vobes, the Bald Explorer, and I know I'm not out and about on a, another walk in the countryside exploring this wonderful landscape. Uh, that's because it's uh, yet again another miserable day. So in my thoughts on what to bring to you uh, in terms of uh, a video about this wonderful country of ours, I'm trying to um, understand how villages came about. Um, and you may know that I've made a couple of videos in which I was reading uh, Professor Hoskin's book, The Making of the English Countryside, and there were some footnotes by a chap called Christopher Taylor, who is a, a leading archaeologist, I think up mainly in the 70s. And he was uh, just pointing out where some of the 1950s knowledge was uh, a little out of date and wrong, and that uh, Professor Hoskins had got a few things not quite right, and in fact um, pointed out that there was a huge tr change in the way that villages had originated around uh, 900 to 1200 um, AD. And that, that was uh, very striking to me. So I've been trying to do some bits of research and I sent off for um, a copy of his book, which I think was published in 76 or something like that. It's called, one of his books is called Fields in the English landscape. And it is by studying the fields, where obviously farming took place, that we can see where the settlements would have been and how the villages got themselves organized and how that changed over the years. And of course, farming being the most important thing for human survival in terms of uh, food production, clearly, um, it's, that's where the story really starts. And also, uh, I'm hoping to put together a sort of history of England, the events, the things that we've sort of forgotten or are not being taught anymore um, in the future once uh, I've got a, a separate studio set up. So at the moment, I'm in a bit of cramped situation in my, in my living room doing this, but um, I hope to have something a bit more organized later on. So, uh, now, let me just pre-see this with the fact that I'm not a historian, I'm not an archaeologist, I am just somebody who's got a general interest in this, and I may get some of these things wrong, so don't, uh, don't come down on me a ton of a bricks if, uh, if I make a few errors in this. I find that the best way for me to learn is not just by reading alone and reading and reading and reading. I find that, that, you know, stuff goes in one ear and goes straight out the other. That by trying to read, make a few notes and then share that knowledge, it sort of goes into the old brain a little bit better. So I've made some notes and for this little bit, I'm going to refer to them and I hope that's all right. I haven't sort of learnt it verbatim, but you know, we'll see how we go. So I'm interested in starting with the prehistory times really, when men, uh, and by men, I mean men and women, families, uh, humans, came into this country, England, and started to farm, and how they farmed, how they survived. And I've got a, a basic understanding of uh, primitive man, but in my head, and I think through my teaching at school, which was very limited, um, I, I've always had this idea that people were more primitive than they actually were. We use the term primitive man, but actually I think that we'll find that they were far more civilized and um, not so much educated in the way that we are, but much more organized and have a greater understanding of nature than we perhaps give them credit for. So we need to go back to about two, uh, 12,000 BC at the end of the Ice Age. And the, uh, the Ice Age had been, and the last of the Ice Ages was melting, and of course it cleared a lot of the land. Everything had been terribly badly frozen, and so there was this uh, bare, bare, ravaged landscape. Um, and it was a slow process in which the vegetation came back, you know, starting with lichens, and then plants, and then trees. And the first trees were birch, and then later pine. But that was followed um, by hazel and then oak and elm and lime. I know from Oliver Rackham's books that down where I am in uh, Sussex and all around the South End, lime trees were absolutely everywhere. And of course, alder, alder liking water. So down in the river valleys 
and uh, in all sort of marsh land. And the Mesolithic people were the sort of first men to arrive and they came around about 800 BC and nomadic people who were hunting the wild animals. So with all this vegetation that was growing up, wild animals had uh, started to uh, live and have their beings in this in this land and the whole place was this real ancient wild wild area and quite dangerous I should think but these nomadic people would come in and hunter gatherers looking for food hunting for food killing it where they were probably putting down some sort of camp but for a very short period, whether that was, I don't know, a week or so, and then move on. So moving around, uh, looking at, for nuts and berries when they could, depending on the season. Um, but we get to about 4000 BC, and that's when the, a newer type of people started to arrive. And of course, we're talking huge swathes of time um, and it's so easy just to say, oh, at 4000 BC this happened and think, oh, OK, they all came in like in one boat. Um, this was all of this is a very gradual process over generations of people. Um, and so around that time, the Neolithic people started to arrive who were a bit more sophisticated, had new technologies and had learnt things from um, where they had come from to this remote island so from Europe and and um, all around in the sort of big uh, conglomerate of land that where all these other sort of people were learning and establishing I mean certainly warmer climates I guess where things were easier to grow and more animals were there to be chased but as they were moving around looking for new places there they came to us with their technology and I, I assume I mean I don't know how the integration took place because the chances are it wasn't like one mass bunch of people coming in on one day and then and like with Julius Caesar a sort of an, an invasion they probably were just coming over in small groups and and maybe getting on maybe some scuffles or what have you but most likely the technology was being shared and developed and the Neolithic people presumably just outgrew the Mesolithic people I don't really know that much however it's around then that the primitive farming or early farming prehistoric farming perhaps is a better way of saying it started to take root and instead of being nomadic these people were the early farmers so they they moved around somewhat but they were starting to cultivate the ground so perhaps they were still doing initially some uh, hunting and gathering but they discovered that these seeds from these grasses could be turned into things like bread uh, and indeed some form of beery beverage and that by gathering the seeds and perhaps knocking them on the floor and planting them they would grow again and 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 of course this concept of cultivating a plant became uh, an important thing and so as that began to develop they would realize that that there must be easier ways to plant these seeds and get them to grow more efficiently. At the same time that the um, evidence from archaeologists have borne out that there were domesticated animals at that time around 4,000, um, including sheep and cattle and even dogs, domesticated dogs, the bones of those have been found. So these people were, were quite organised and uh, they, they were beginning to know what they were doing. But one of the things that was absolutely necessary in order to grow anything was to clear the forests. And this wild wood, this, this tangle of different types of um, madness of, of trees and plants and things which which all wild boar and wolves and bears and goodness knows what were living in needed to be cleared so that these early farmers could not only grow something but also protect that area to protect their crop as well and so using as we know with the Neolithics they were amazing with flint and tools like that 
um, they developed their axes and were able to chop down forests and in some cases burn them. Although I, having read um, Oliver Rackham's book, he, he says that the English trees, the deciduous trees, are not so easy to, to burn. You can't just burn them because they're so full of water. So they don't just, you know, burn as easy as you think. Once they're dead, they'll burn. So um, maybe there's certain trees like pine which burn better than oaks and ash and elm and things like that. But anyway, they were clearing, clearing this land. And around about 3500 BC, this clearance was increasing. And it, would, it seems that what was going on is they would clear a bit of land, they would grow some crops, perhaps you know, a generation of growing crops would happen, but the nutrients would be depleted. And at that stage, they hadn't worked out that uh, sheep was a fantastic way of fertilizing and putting fertile, fertiliz fertilization back into the ground, or indeed growing uh, legumes, peas and things like that, which would put nitrogen um, back into the ground. So the easiest option then, not knowing that simple bit of knowledge, is to well, leave that to regenerate and go and clear another bit. So they would stay for a while in these farmsteads, but then move around. And meanwhile, this, this land was probably just regenerating. And of course, by doing that, it's naturally putting back um, all the nutrients back in. But so they're still a bit nomadic, but they're staying there possibly for you know decades and then moving about um, from what I've gleaned of it. Um, however, we do get to a point where we know around that time some of the techniques that they were using for plowing the fields, which is um, quite ast astounding. There's a, um, a burial mound um, in uh, near Avebury called South Street and it's a long barrow, I think. And underneath, the archaeologists have actually, I don't know how they do this. I don't know how they manage to work this out, but they've gone down to a level, which they seem to think is about um, 3,500 BC. And they've discovered this early plowing technique of what can basically be pointed sticks. I think these are called crook ards, which is a bit like a hoe, a big hoe that have been dragged across the field to basically to, to open up the earth. And it's been dragged across in strips and then crisscrossed the opposite way to break it up more so. Uh, so not having a proper plow, which would dig deep and turn the soil over. So totally fascinating. And so then they would presumably scatter their seeds, broadcast in the old fashioned way, and, and these things would have grown. Um, and so these early fields started to develop. And it's the fields that I'm interested in because, you know, as you go through time, the fields and how the fields are delineated give you the, the sides of the fields, which gives you the roots and the roads and the infrastructure and the wiggles that we still have today in some of our country roads, not the motorways that blast through things, but the, the wiggly, you know, and you think, gosh, some of these lanes have been there since these very, very early times. Um, so that's, that's fascinating. And of course, it's also around that 3,000, 3,500 time that you've got the, the uh, monuments going up, the, the Stonehenges and the Avebury and all of that, which tells you that these people were incredibly organized and civilized um, and able to do these amazing things. They're not just sort of hand-to-mouth, hunter-gatherer people. They're, they're uh, uh, organizations and some form of politics going on and leaders and tribes and all of that, which Sometimes it's very hard to get your head round all of that. Anyway, um, what else have we got here? Now, no tools have been found at that time, the ploughing tool, apparently, according to Christopher Taylor writing in the 70s. Now, maybe there is, and maybe people can correct me, maybe they have found these things. Um, but it's, what's interesting is about the, the field size themselves. So what we have to bear in mind is the 
fields that we that still survive today are those fields that have not been obliterated by um, the Saxons, by the Romans, by the Normans, by the, um, the, the, the land enclosures and by modern times, the 18th century uh, enclosures and things like that, and indeed by tractor. So the ones that we have, have got are actually very few that still exist. You can still work out where these fields are, um, but they're in what would be the most undesirable places to have them because the desirable ones have all gone. Uh, they've been obliterated. So when you see them, they tend to be on slopes, which are probably not ideal and have now and since been left really for pasture. So the damage has not been taken away. Now it's worth thinking, well, why would they be ploughing on those undesirable places anyway? And the reason has to be that everywhere else was cleared, everywhere else was already farmed, that space was actually running out and they needed what was technically waste ground to carry on farming. And if that was the case, why? Because the population was growing. And so Christopher Taylor and the other archaeologists have worked out that actually much of England um, and probably follows for Scotland and, and Wales, but much of England had already been cleared by the Neolithic people very uh, well before the Romans arrived, well before the end of the Iron Age, and a lot of it had been uh, farmed and, um, and the population had grown because they needed all this uh, land in order to provide enough food for them so that they were having to go to these bits of wasteland, which was not ideal, to try and get some extra food. So I find that absolutely fascinating. And the size of these fields are about um, 0.2 to 0.5 hectares. Now, I don't know what that equates to acres, um, but they were square fields, these early prehistoric fields, square field or somewhat oblong and this pattern is repeated all around England and then we get into the Iron Age and then we get to what the Romans did and if you've enjoyed this and I haven't bored you too much I'll make some notes on the next stage and um, what would be great is to try and find some of these fields and obviously go and visit them and stand in these fields particularly the ones that have not been farmed since well you know 6,000 years ago it would be pretty amazing anyway that's my little offering for today I hope it's been of some interest as I try to work out how the settlements and the villages and this land started in my heritage landscape and nature of the Bald Explorer. Thank you so much. Give me a thumbs up if you've enjoyed it. Uh, don't forget to follow, like and subscribe and I will see you hopefully out and about on another video soon. Till then, bye bye.